Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, a lack of power and water in an oil-rich economy, the challenges facing Iraq's next government. Also this week, a coffee fix calls for consumers to wake up to challenges, leaving coffee farmers in poverty. Plus, Google at 20, a look at how the search engine which changed the internet impacts our lives. Of this week, German conglomerate Siemens said it's in discussions to help get Iraq's power grid up and running. Iraqis held elections in May and the country is in the process of forming a new government. So the timing is interesting. Since the defeat of ISIL last year, there have been widespread protests about a breakdown in public services. Rebuilding efforts in Iraq have been slow. It's estimated that $100 billion is needed for reconstruction in the next 10 years. Iraq's allies pledged $30 billion at a donor conference in February. But part of the problem is ensuring the uncorrupt use of the country's oil wealth and reconstruction funding. Nevertheless, there has been some progress. Rob Matheson reports now from Baghdad on a railway project underway in Fallujah. Two shining rails stretching west from Baghdad, snaking through the desert for 57 kilometers. At the other end is the city of Fallujah, accessible once again to rail travelers. Fallujah of today is not like Fallujah in the past. The railroad is a sign of life getting back to normal after getting rid of ISIL. These rail tracks were closed when ISIL fighters swept through the west of Iraq in 2014. When Iraqi Railways reopens the Baghdad to Fallujah line, we didn't think of the economic benefit. This is a message of peace to the people of Fallujah after the dark days when ISIL used to rule those parts. After the defeat of ISIL, there have been roads that have been opened between Baghdad and Fallujah, but they're peppered with security checks. And that journey can take anything up to several hours. But this train doesn't stop for checkpoints. The journey between Baghdad and Fallujah takes just 55 minutes by railway. And the high cost of fuel means traveling by road is more expensive. Basic train tickets for a one-way journey cost just under $2. Going by the train is much easier. We avoid traffic jams, many checkpoints across the highway, or even deadly car accidents. It's also much cheaper than road transport. When the train arrives in Fallujah, 57 kilometers may not seem far. But this reopened track is a milestone for Iraq's railways. Well, joining me now from London is Shuan Zulal. Shuan is a fellow at King's College and the managing director of Carducci Consulting. Good to have you with us. So from the protests in the south, it looks like a pretty urgent situation. How urgent is the electricity crisis from an economic perspective, though? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, the, the electricity crisis in Iraq is not one issue that can be resolved overnight. Um, uh, there's a compounding... Uh, spontaneous issues with the electricity sector. For example, if you look at the, um, uh, the the power generation and demand, they're completely at odds with each other, especially at peak time. If you look at the, um, in, in the heat of summer, for example, in the month of July, uh, there's almost 50% shortage in the electricity generation to, why to is that, uh, meet Shwan? peak demand. Why, why is there such, uh, you know, why are they at, at such odds with each other? Why is electricity grid in such a bad shape to start off with in such an oil-rich country? Well, as I say, there's uh, plenty of issues. I mean, one of the main issues for me is the, uh, the fact that the business model for electricity sector in Iraq doesn't work. It doesn't work, uh, for example, it's all government-owned, that uh, there's no enough investment coming into the sector. And secondly, the, the government uh, who owns, who sort of manages the electricity sector doesn't really collect uh, enough uh, from the consumers. When you say, you know, not enough money is coming in, Officially, 40 billion U.S. dollars has been allocated to the power sector over the last, what, 15 years? Where did that money go? Well, if we look at the, um, I mean, Iraq, uh, generally, the, 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 the corruption is sort of eating the country alive. For example, if you look at um, Basra, is a very good example. You mentioned the protest. 
uh, not only electricity, even water hasn't been managed to be provided, although despite millions, uh, billions of dollars has been spent on the sector to try to revamp it. But because of the, the way the, uh, the bureaucracy works and the, 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 the multi-layer corruption, you have this monopoly from the private um, local small um, uh, power generator, very polluting, very noisy in a neighborhood, which charge extortionate amounts of money. Given what you said then, can the solution be, you know, it's been suggested building more Siemens power stations, for example, which can convert or rely on the conversion of flare gas. If the problem is corruption, if the problem is much deeper than simply not enough supply of electricity, it's waste, corruption, etc., extortion, racketeering, that doesn't sound like something you can solve with more flare conversion gas stations. Definitely not. I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the recent news about Siemens um, sort of bringing 300,000, uh, bringing electricity to 300,000 Iraqis uh, is a very welcome news. Uh, the problem is, as you mentioned, you can increase uh, uh, you know, power, power generation, but the, the demand increases because the, the, the consumer doesn't take responsibility at the same time, if you if you're not if you're not paying your bills, you wouldn't be um, you know keeping a tap on how much how much electricity you use. So the more you increase generation, the the consumption grows up. And given the Iraqi population is growing at a fast rate, um, it, 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 this catch-up game is just never works. I was at an Iraq in, uh, reconstruction conference in Kuwait last year, where. Around 30 billion US dollars was committed to help Iraq, particularly with its infrastructural problems. Is any of that money actually materializing? Uh, not really, no. I think, um, and that's a testament to itself. The investors, the international community are willing to help. Investors are willing to invest because Iraq, as you mentioned, there is a huge wealth, oil wealth, is uh, coming through, especially with now with high oil prices. However, when uh, investors go to Iraq and look at the, uh, the regulatory environment, look at the way, um, uh, how sluggish uh, the bureaucracy is, uh, most uh, investors uh, at the end give up. I mean, for example, there are good uh, ideas, there are good projects. For example, there's solar, which is, um, you know, could resolve a lot of the issues, especially in the house. There's plenty of uh, sun in Iraq, there's no shortage of it. And the peak demand usually in Iraq in, in summer month in, during the afternoon where the sun is blazing. So air conditioning can easily be, you know, the, the sun can easily be converted to power to uh, power air conditioning in Iraq. Let's thank very much Shuan Zalal. Thank you for your uh, comments on this. Thank you. U.S. President Donald Trump's second round of Iran sanctions targeting oil exports are due to kick in in November. And the EU has come up with an idea, a special purpose vehicle, a legal payments tool to help companies continue trading and buying oil from Iran. Russia and China also want in, but it's unclear how it'll work. Shihab Ritansi has more from Washington, D.C. The EU is reported to have been discussing what it calls a special purpose vehicle for several weeks. The EU foreign policy chief said it would be going ahead. EU member states will set up a legal entity to facilitate legitimate financial transactions with Iran, and this will allow European companies to continue to trade with Iran in accordance with European Union law and could be open to other partners in the world. The plans discussed in the past have involved an entity being set up to act as a go-between or clearinghouse between Iran and other nations to facilitate commercial transactions. For example, if a country or company wants to buy Iranian oil, it would send money to or perhaps engage in a barter system involving this entity which will handle the transaction with Iran. The same will be true in reverse for Iran's dealings with the rest of the world. The idea is to bypass commercial and central banks who are fearful of being frozen out of the US financial system if they help circumvent the new sanctions being imposed by the Trump administration against Iran in November. However, the details have yet to be worked out, and there is some skepticism that the system will work, especially given the large number of European companies already curtailing their business dealings with Iran. Those meeting at the UN also announced that Iran remained in compliance with the nuclear deal and pledged their commitment to remain participants. Still to come on Counting the Cost, Argentina gets the biggest loan in the IMF's history. But first, Google is celebrating turning 20 years old. What began as a simple search engine is now a technology giant which has revolutionized the world 
and the way we do things. Rob Reynolds reports from Mountain View, California in just a few minutes. But first, here's Charlotte Bellis with a quick snapshot of the rise of Google. Let's start in Menlo Park, California, where Google was born on September the 27th, 1998. Working out of Susan Wojcicki's garage, now the CEO of YouTube, Sergey Brin and Larry Page launched a search engine unlike any other. The Stanford graduate students decided to list search results based on how many other pages were linked to it, not keywords. You get the most relevant results at the top. Google also provides you with a really fast, efficient interface. Well, we really measure is how long does it take from when you have an information need until Google has satisfied that need for you. 20 years on and Google is now a verb. A simple search will scour 1.9 billion websites to produce a ranked list of results. Google's offerings expanded in 2004 as the company went public and debuted Gmail, revolutionizing webmail. The next year came Google Maps, the year after it bought YouTube. And in the last decade, Google released its file storage service called Google Drive, smartphones, self-driving cars, and advanced speakers. Billions of people now use Google products every day, most through its search engine. In 2012, Google reached 1.2 trillion searches for the year, but that's where the data stops. Google now just says searches are in the trillions. And with advertising the main source of revenue, the money follows the page views. Google's profit soared to $110 billion last year, while Alphabet, its parent company, has a market valuation of $820 billion. This is what Google's search page looked like the day it was launched. And this is the company's first headquarters, with founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Twenty years later, Google's enormous success has given it this huge, ever-expanding Silicon Valley headquarters known as the Googleplex. Page and Brin are multi-billionaires, and Google knows a lot about us. They know well, who you are, they know a lot about your habits, um, they know what kind of videos you watch. They know how many emails you get. They are a very large and important part of most people's daily lives. Its search engine processes three and a half billion requests per day or 1.2 trillion a year. That information is power. Google uses the information to lucratively target advertising to customers. The more they know about you, the more they can market you to advertisers. The collection of our activities and what we do every day um, you know, who, what are the rules? What are the rules that govern that when, when a company collects and amasses that much information? In the U.S., Google, like other big tech companies, is largely unregulated regarding what they do with the information they collect. The idea that these companies will self-regulate is, is laughable, and I think it's been shown that is insufficient. That may be changing. In congressional hearings this week, lawmakers discussed a federal Internet privacy law to regulate big tech companies' behavior. The European Union has taken a stricter line, passing sweeping new online privacy rules and recently levying heavy multi-billion dollar fines on Google for anti-competitive practices. Google's corporate culture appears to be changing. Earlier this year, Google quietly dropped its famous motto, don't be evil, from its corporate code of conduct. In April, 3,000 Google employees signed a petition demanding the company end its partnership with the Pentagon, called Project Maven, that uses images and artificial intelligence to improve drone strike accuracy on the battlefield. Google now says it will not renew its Pentagon contract when it expires in 2019. In just two decades, Google has made itself practically indispensable in the lives of billions of people what it will do with its information, power, and wealth over the next 20 years is something that should concern each one of them. Tesla without Elon Musk at the wheel. The stock market regulator in the U.S. is seeking to bar him from serving as the electric car maker's CEO. The Securities and Exchange Commission alleges he committed securities fraud when he tweeted about privatization plans. The agency's complaint is the first fraud case involving the use of social media by the CEO of a public company. In a statement issued by Tesla, Musk called the SEC action unjustified. 
Wake up and smell the coffee. That's the message to consumers of coffee drinks all over the world this week. You see, the international price of coffee has fallen below one US dollar per pound. Bumper harvests and weaker currencies in places like Brazil are being blamed. And that's jeopardizing the livelihoods of 25 million coffee farmers. Now, the International Coffee Organization says some coffee farmers may be forced to abandon production altogether. Alessandro Rampietti has more from Rovira in Colombia. Alirio Morales' coffee plants are as lush and loaded with beans as ever. Yet, for the first time, he's considering leaving them on the tree. With the situation as it is right now, we can't continue producing. We are running out of fertilizers. We can't pay our debts or pay the workers. We've reached our limit. The price buyers pay for Alirio's precious Arabica beans has fallen to less than one US dollar a pound. That's less than what it costs to grow the coffee in Colombia's mountainous, labor-intensive coffee region. I've seen people crying over what they're being paid for a bag of hard-earned beans, people just crying out of desperation. Current prices mean that farmers make less than one cent of a U.S. dollar for each cup of coffee sold across the world. Farmers here in Colombia are wondering for just how long they'll be able to work at these prices. Others already gave up, like the owners of this field that abandoned it two months ago. It's very painful. It's devastating because we spent all of our life growing coffee. These are new plants that just started producing last year. So much work, such a big investment. Yet the situation is so bad that these people decided to let the beans rot. A small representation of farmers held a sit-in in front of the Embassy of the European Union in Bogota to bring attention to their situation. Alirio says he's giving up hope. I'm not sure what we're going to do. What I do know is that it's not sustainable and that we might be close to the end of the road. The Colombian government said it's considering emergency financial help for the growers. But unless farmers receive a more fair share of the cut, their beloved Java will leave them with nothing but a bitter taste. So as Alessandro was reporting, there's a bitter truth at the heart of the industry. This kind of crop, you see, is not economically sustainable, at least not for the farmers. 90% of the world's coffee production takes place in developing countries. If the cost of production suddenly goes up for a coffee farmer, they have few to no options. Now, there are growing calls for leading companies, including Nestle and Starbucks, to commit to buying coffee at more than the cost of production. This week, Starbucks said it's committing up to $20 million to provide emergency relief to the smallholder farmers at the bottom of its supply chain. Joining me now from London is Jose Sete. Jose is the executive director of the International Coffee Organization. Good to have you with us. So first of all, explain to us if coffee production is expected to increase going forward. Is that going to push prices down further, eliminate eventually a lot of farmers, and then the price comes to some kind of profitable equilibrium? Well, that's, uh, that uh, is uh, the worst-case uh, scenario, I think. Uh, uh, coffee is a cyclical commodity. It's a perennial crop. It's a tree crop. So uh, uh, the adjustments uh, to changes in uh, uh, supply and demand take time, uh, but what we need is much greater support uh, from the industry uh, during this difficult uh, period. And uh, this is in the self-interest of the industry. Uh, they need uh, coffee supplies going forward. Uh, in the long term, the future for coffee is very bright. Uh, demand is increasing steadily. We are opening uh, new markets. Uh, especially in Asia. Uh, so the, the prospects uh, for coffee demand are great, but we face uh, immense challenges. Uh, first, in uh, prices right now, that's an immediate challenge, but uh, in the medium and long term, we have to deal with climate change, we have to deal with uh, aging farmers and uh, attract youth to uh, coffee farming, uh, we have to close the so-called gender gap and uh, make uh, 
uh, uh, coffee more uh, coffee cultivation more attractive for women more profitable for women all okay, of these well, are let, let me jump in there if i could jose challenge. when you say it's in the mm. interests of the yeah. industry the, the producers the companies to make sure that the farmers aren't wiped out surely it's only in their interest just to keep those farmers barely alive so that the production uh, continues uh, to keep the price as low as possible. It's not in their interest to really make sure that they get a really good, generous slice of the coffee pie, right? Well, uh, look, the, the, the amount uh, that goes to, uh, of, of the total uh, revenues of the industry that goes to farmers is uh, very small. Uh, well, it, well, it is. So are, my question is, what's difficult. the solution? If it's not a cartel, then regulation? I mean, I mean what can you do? This t the livelihoods um, of 25 million people could be at stake. So how do you help them without distorting market forces? Like I said, I think uh, we have to raise awareness uh, in the industry about their uh, shared responsibility uh, uh, so that they can... Uh, invest more in the sustainability of coffee farmer, uh, farming. Let me just give you a couple of figures. Uh, we estimate that the uh, total uh, revenues from coffee all over the world per year are around uh, more, more than $200 billion a year. Now, that, of that, maybe $16 billion, around 8% reaches the, the farmer. Uh, in addition, the industry does already invest in some sustainability initiatives, uh, and that uh, we estimate to be around $350 million a year. Now, this is the figure that I think uh, needs to be looked at carefully, and uh, the industry needs to really up their game and uh, uh, increase this and uh, uh, invest a lot more in the sustainability of farmers, which are the base of their business. If they don't, farmers can switch crops. They can move if, on if and do other things. If they don't, they won't have... Well, if they don't, they won't have uh, the coffee supplies that they will need in the future. And what if, does that uh, mean for the world, we for other world problems, what, like you mentioned, the environment, uh, human migration, and so on? There's a lot at stake here, right? Exactly. We uh, pauperization. Uh, we see uh, uh, unauthorized migration, uh, both uh, from Central America to the U.S., but also from Africa uh, to to Europe. Uh, so uh, this uh, is likely to put uh, uh, more pressure on uh, the existing uh, tendencies that uh, are already out there. So, uh, as, I, as I said before, it's in the self-interest of the roasting industry to invest more in the health and the sustainability of the farmers. Thanks so much, Jose. You've given us a lot of ideas to distill over a cup of coffee. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, and keep drinking coffee. <laughs> And finally, a bigger and faster bailout. Argentina has secured the biggest ever loan in the history of the International Monetary Fund. Argentina is battling a budget deficit, an economic crisis and a collapsing currency. So this week, the IMF increased the previous bailout package to $57 billion. Christine Lagarde, managing director of the IMF, says the $7 billion boost is all about restoring investor confidence. The fund remains fully committed to helping Argentina tackle the challenges that it faces. It is the largest ever program that the IMF is putting together. We stand by Argentina and we have confidence in the efforts that they want to deploy. The big change is in two numbers. 1919, 19 billion US dollars additional for 2019. And that's our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email, 
Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Thank you.